you know, unfortunately, we're talking about food where, you know, you can be marketed to very easily and you don't know what you're getting. You always have to look at the ingredient profile on the back. Now, this will require a lot of research. 6.5 grams of citrulline that gives you a pump has been shown to be effective in research. But you purchase this pre-workout and it only says 1.5 grams of citrulline. Then it doesn't matter that this does not going to have an effect on you. Who are not necessarily into weight training and just want to be healthy. What's the scientific truth about multivitamins? What's the scientific truth about fish oils? A diet full of raw veggies and different colored fruits and vegetables do the same job for you that multivitamins can? Uh, a lot of the time, no, unfortunately. Okay. If you were to ask me this question maybe 60, 70 years ago, I'd have a different answer. Because now with the overpopulation of the countries, the overharvestation of the food, uh, our soil now is very much depleted to what it was many, many years ago. All right, this is part three of our health special with Chris Gethin. We began this particular episode trying to cover the A to Z of supplements and the right way of supplementation. Remember, Chris Gethin has trained some of the world's top athletes. He's also trained Rithik Roshan. He's trained John Abraham. If there's anyone who knows a thing or two about muscle building, it is this person. The conversation began with supplements, but then eventually we spoke a lot about musculature, hypertrophy, how to get the most out of your workouts, etc, etc. So it's a conversation for fitness nerds. You're going to enjoy this. For more episodes like this, make sure you follow us on Spotify. Every episode is a Spotify exclusive, which means that it's available 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. This is another fitness special with Chris Gethin, and it's coming straight at you. Chris Gethin is back. You guys asked us for an entire episode on supplements. That's what we're doing today, Chris. Uh, let's start with a very simple question for you. This is, comes in from every single Indian teenager or college student who's arguing with his parents about protein shakes being safe for human consumption by a young adult or a teenager. What do you have to say to the parents? Well, when it comes to... Uh, protein, for instance, we'll use that as an example. People think, they they quickly assume that it's some sort of performance enhancement, it's, it's a steroid, when it isn't. All it is, is the dairy, uh, yeah, the protein that's extracted from the dairy, such as the milk, without a lot of the fat, without the lactose, a lot of the time it's just naturally flavored. Mm. So there's nothing wrong with it. However, you gotta look at the source, make sure that number one, it isn't from black market, it's from a reputable source. And all it's there is to help that person get their protein requirements in when they're weightlifting. You know, yeah. it's absolutely fine. Now, the age, look, I'm an owner of a supplement company, so I can't say, yeah, a 15-year-old is fine. Anything over the age of 18 is, is fine. Up until then, you should just focus on your nutrition, your food, making sure that you have a decent amount of food in your program because you can't replace food. You know, you, 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 the supplement is there just to supplement your diet. But anything over the age of 18, you're good to go. Are you saying that from an ethical place in terms of you gotta make a kid work hard for his muscle gains? Of course. Okay. Yeah, like um, mm. I didn't start taking supplements until I was about 25 years old. You know, up until then I was choking down mm. tins of tuna and dry <laughs> potato, looking in the magazines going, I want to be one of those guys. Mm. And I think the difference is that once I, you start having protein shakes, you just get results slightly faster. Am I right? Well, it's more convenient to get that amount of protein in because if you're eating six meals a day, it gets pretty boring mm. and, you know, pretty quick. Mm. So if you're able to drink some of those meals and it tastes good, it's a chocolate shake, you can put the chocolate powder on your boring oats. It just makes it a lot easier. Mm. And straight after your workouts, you want to try to repair the damaged muscle tissue that you've created in the gym, that trauma, as soon as humanly possible. And there's nothing more bioavailable than a protein isolate. Egg whites are going to be number two. So if you can't get the protein in, then have the egg white, sure. But how many people want to have eight egg whites? <laughs> Not many. So a protein shake makes it a lot more convenient. Yeah, so it's just the convenience factor. Convenience of... and the bioavailability. Mm. 
um you know we spoke about how much protein is required by the human body if you're active whether you're putting on muscle or whether you're burning off fat it's roughly um x, x grams per pound of body weight 1 gram per pound of body weight yeah okay 1 gram per pound of body weight now in saying that if you go above that 1 gram per pound of body weight do you get faster results or is there like an upper limit there is a limit for sure like i usually go up to about 1.5 but i train extremely hard and a lot of my clients train me extremely hard and i'm breaking down a lot of tissue so like for maybe 20 years i've basically had sore legs mm. from my leg workouts you know i find it funny when people go oh my legs are so sore and i'm like God, I don't know what it's like not to have sore legs, mm. but that's the way I train. So I require a little bit more protein than uh, than the average uh, person. You know, it all comes down to how hard you how hard you train and what body part you're training on that particular day. If you're training just your biceps, you're not going to need as much as say if you're training your back. Mm. Um, how many scoops of protein should one consume? Say, if a scoop is about twenty five grams of protein, it all depends on the size of the individual. But can you go up to like three or four? Yeah, for sure. Really? Yeah, like I have uh, some clients who find it very inconvenient to eat because of their job requirements, their traveling, or something like that. So some of them will have like five or six scoops a day, but they'll eat three meals. So if somebody does have protein, uh, let's say as one meal then i don't want them to have protein as a second second meal as well or protein powder i need some sort of sustenance in their body i need more micronutrients in there more of a balance approach so they can alternate meal protein powder meal protein powder i will allow that so if a young person comes to you and i also include women in this young person yeah. angle uh, and if they say hey chris should i be taking protein supplements i'm going about my weight training what would you say next over the 18 for sure yeah you can include that maybe straight after your workout mm. if you're having your oats in the morning you want to have a scoop in there instead of egg white sure mm. and even if they're not active in the gym if they're not active in the in the gym yeah sure maybe one one scoop a day is absolutely fine it's like my parents aren't really active in the gym but they'll have a couple of scoops of protein per day because as you get a little bit older you go through muscle atrophy as well so you require protein but do they work out no mm uh, i think the other argument against protein shakes in general is that it supposedly puts a load on your organs specifically your kidney is there any scientific truth to this nothing nothing, nothing. whatsoever you won't find any scientific truth to that because your body will digest protein powder easier than any other food period mm also in indian gyms the narrative and this is something i've also followed as a trainer probably just to get people into a better habit i've always told people that the moment you start lifting weights drink a lot more water for sure because your protein absorption also becomes faster so i've gotten a lot more people to drink more water which then has countless other benefits but say if you are combining a lack of water intake with a lot of protein consumption i'm not just talking about protein shakes i'm also talking about meat paneer whatever protein sources that can lead to problems right yeah your know, body's made up of about 75% h2o so if you're not feeding the fluid to that body then the body's just not going to function the brain's not going to function correctly either mm. a lot of people have headaches and it's not because they need uh paracetamol or aspirin it's because they're dehydrated the brain's dehydrated gotcha you know and the muscles cannot contract adequately without proper hydration so is the test for hydration the urine test where you look at your piss and you see it clear and then that probably means you're hydrated but the moment you see a little yellow means you've got to go and drink some water is that the correct way of going that's a correct way but if you're going to take certain vitamins as well that can lead to yellow water as a uh, yellow piss as well so <laughs> you know you got to look at it when are you taking your vitamins as well how do you know how much water to drink um it, it all depends on how much that person sweats but i usually have my clients on about a gallon of water a day if it's a smaller female for instance it could be like 3 to 4 liters mm. uh but for a bigger kind of guy it's usually a 5 plus got you so let's let's move on to other supplements now uh but before we move on i want to ask you what rithik and john took to build their bodies in terms of supplementation i'm assuming you had them on creatine as well yeah yeah that, so i've got yeah for instance i got uh, rithik on creatine uh, right now um so creatine protein powder uh, a lot of antioxidants because they're going through a lot of free radical damage so that's like vitamin C glutathione uh, PQQ 
uh, My Vital C, which is a carbon C60. It's a Nobel winning atom, uh, uh, a carbon, sorry, not atom, carbon. And uh, My Vital C is like a human grade of that. And then hydrogen rich water. So, hydrogen rich water and My Vital C, they have high antioxidant value that doesn't cause a hormetic blunting response. So, when you're working out, you want what's called hormesis, inflammation from your workout. And that's what causes the body to go, you know what? This is trauma. I need to continue to grow, get stronger, more powerful, et cetera. Let me just break that yeah. down a little bit. When you're doing a bicep curl, your bicep heats up. Like when you take it to failure, yeah, that's the inflammation. Yeah, and it breaks down muscle tissue. So the next day when your biceps are sore, it's because you've torn little myofibrils, muscle fibers basically, inside the muscle fibers. You've broken them down. They're sore. So now you want that traumatic response from it, that inflammatory response to continue to grow. However, if you take things like vitamin C or vitamin E, that will blunt that mm. around your workout. Any other time is fine, but not around your workout. But you can take other antioxidants, such as hydrogen-rich water, such as carbon C60, that is very, very high in antioxidants, but it won't blunt that response. So it's great at beating a lot of the free radical damage that we endure without blunting that response from training. So I get them on those supplements as well. Uh, glutamine. Mm. So glutamine is uh, the most abundant amino acid in your body, but it's also good for gut health as well. So glutamine for that purpose. What does it do to the aesthetics of the physique or to the muscle building process? It prevents atrophy. Muscle loss. Yes. Uh, along with, say, with uh, branched-chain amino acids as well. Branched-chain amino acids can provide muscle energy, muscle energy output, but actually prevent some of the catabolic response from weight training as well. You know, we, we'll break down BCAAs in detail because it's probably India's most popular supplement after okay. creatine and protein shakes. Yeah. But specifically glutamine, this is debated in Indian gyms. So Chris Gethin is saying that you should be having it because it will pre prevent atrophy. Yes. So assuming that, say, Ritik or John or whoever is uh, on a very intense professional schedule, would you put them on glutamine then? Or are they on glutamine throughout the year? Like, when when do you actually put someone no, on? No, when, when they're on hard training. Hard when training. Go, when they're going through hard training, yes. But why would atrophy happen in a phase of hard training? Because when you go to the gym and train extremely hard, that is the most catabolic thing that we can do. We lose muscle when we train. We actually have to do it, though, to signal muscle growth through recovery, from nutrition, from sleep, okay? So you have to cause that trauma in order to recover from the trauma. So this is a catabolic uh, experience, and then yeah. you, have to, uh, you have to make sure that all your anabolic experiences together overpower the catabolic exactly. experience. Exactly, exactly. How do you supplement with glutamine? Like when? Is it during the workout? Uh, it's usually before and after the workout. During the workout, I'll usually have branched chain amino acids and essential amino acids, okay? Creatine before and after the workout, bookend that workout. Protein powder straight after the workout. Mm. That's when I usually have it, yeah. Okay. And glutamine as well, usually about 20 grams. So uh, he'll have a couple of bottles of water with glutamine in there, with creatine in there. So it's taken throughout the day as well. Let's let's boil it down to the basics again. I think the average listener here is concerned about looking hot, mm -hmm. like looking good. Um, there's very few people who are only concerned about putting on muscle mass. Yeah, I think I'd put all women in that category who are concerned about putting on muscle mass and a few guys who are fitness nerds. But primarily, most of the men watching this are watching this for aesthetics. So keeping that in mind, say there's case A with someone who's only supplementing with protein shakes and maybe creatine. Case B, who's supplementing with protein shakes, creatine, and then glutamine added to it. Mm -hmm. What would be the percentage difference in the results with the same training or the same duration of time? Look, all these supplements together probably provide about 5% of your overall <laughs> gains. You know, a lot of people put a lot of value in supplements. No, it's going to come down to the consistency and the intensity of your training, your nutrition, your sleep, and your hydration. Then the other 5%, again, dependent on the individual though, 5% will be made up from the supplementation that you take to help with the recovery and fuel your workouts, okay? Um, now, there could be a case where, let's say that person 
just cannot eat the six meals mm. and they rely on supplements for three of those meals, then maybe the supplements are going to be a bigger percentage now for that individual. All comes down to a case cup by case basis. But is also focusing on sleep, you know, is the correct uh, way to go. And case B is having all the supplements, but getting about six hours of sleep every night, which is not horrible, but it's not optimum either. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be the percentage difference in the two? It'd probably be another 5% on top of that. Okay. You gotcha. know, so that, you know, you're getting a lot of sleep or plenty of sleep. Some people work well on less sleep, but then they overtrain, which makes it a little bit worse. They, you know, let's say if they're not sleeping that much, but now they train five, six times a week, that's not going to be optimal for them. Mm. You know, if you're sleeping less, you probably need to train less. Uh, I remember on the first episode we did, we spoke about yoga nidra very briefly, but I think in that episode you had misunderstood uh, what I was saying. You highlighted pranayam, I highlighted yoga nidra, and we went on our two separate tangents. I'm going to talk about yoga nidra a little bit again. Yeah. It in uh, the scientific world, it's called progressive muscle relaxation. Ah, okay. Yeah, it's the same. The yoga nidra is a slightly more nuanced version of progressive muscle relaxation. And in the world of yoga, they tell us to do it ideally four to five hours before you go to sleep to enhance the quantity of REM sleep you experience when you're actually sleeping, which in the long-term scheme of things reduces your sleep quota. And I've noticed this with myself, mm. both like combining yoga nidra, like the progressive muscle relaxation, along with meditation, reduces how much sleep I need. Yeah. Which effectively in the sum of things, it gives me more time to do other shit, which exactly. could also be no longer work. It comes the quality, not always the quantity. Yeah. You know, while we're speaking about workouts, do you also want to kind of give a guideline when it comes to total time dedicated to a weight training session? Sure. Yeah. You know, when it comes to a smaller muscle group, let's say, could be shoulders, for instance, that workout could probably last maybe 30, 40 minutes. Mm. You know, very, it's, it's not long. But then if it's a larger muscle group, which requires more oxygen, uh, more ATP, Addison triphosphate, so you have to rest a little bit longer between the sets. Um, it could be like an hour, hour mm. long workout. Yeah. If you so, see people stretching it to 90 minutes, what's your take? They probably haven't trained hard enough. Um, you know, that's usually the, the protocol. So, you know, maybe they're taking too long of a rest. Maybe they're not training to absolute failure. They think that they're training hard, but they're not actually training hard. Usually it, it turns out to be volume as opposed to intensity. So your gauge of a good workout is wrap it up in an hour. Yeah, well, the gauge is that you shouldn't have anything left in the tank. If someone comes and trains with me, I'm not blowing my own horn here, but if they come and train with me and they're able to train after we finish the session, yeah. they haven't trained hard enough. Got it. You know, and that's, I don't think that's ever happened. You know, I, I hear you and I'm on the same page as you, on the exact same page. The issue, especially in Indian gyms, is a lot of people don't focus enough on their form. And in this process of getting everything to failure, I mean, it's okay to lose your, a bit of your form sometimes, but there is a real lack of form-based education in um, the world of Indian exercise. Mm. I think it's getting fixed gradually through YouTube, etc. Back in the day, there was nothing. Everyone was just doing anything. So do you see this a lot? Uh, I've noticed it uh, through the injuries that a lot of people have here. A lot of back issues, mm. a lot of slip discs, ruptured discs. So... I can only assume it happened a lot. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, and, I, and I think, it, you know, it's okay to use a little bit of control cheating after you've reached absolute failure with a very strict movement. So as an example, I'm talking about this because it happened this morning. I had Riddick do drop sets on side raises, for instance, seated. We did three drop sets seated. Then when he couldn't do any more in a very strict fashion, sat down, I got him to stand up. Because now you're going to start to use a little bit of momentum from your lower back, maybe a little bit from your traps, but it's okay if you pre-fatigue the muscle already. Gotcha. So that's okay in that instance, once you've reached absolute failure with very strict form. Got it. Uh, I think we should highlight BCAAs as well before moving on to creatine. Sure. So with BCAAs, what is the <laughs> scientific truth now? Because again, with supplementation, the studies keep changing every two years. I've noticed this. But as of October 2022, where are we? Okay, so um, again, okay, it's kind of individual based as well, I guess. Like if you're very intuitive to your body, don't always have to rely on science, you know? Like a lot of things would, for instance, my style of training really isn't backed up with science, but does it work? Well, yeah, I, I, I've shown that it works. So when it comes to branched chain amino acids, uh, you know, you have 
leucine, isoleucine and valine. Leucine is the really anabolic signaler, but it's more efficient when you actually have the supporting amino acids as well. The, those three amino acids that make up the branch chain amino acids. So what we've seen is that it can prevent muscle atrophy and provide muscle energy. Where I actually found this worked better was when I started doing a lot of endurance-based sports. So a lot of Spartan, like obstacle races, ultra marathons, Ironman triathlon. That's when I really noticed the distance uh, difference where I found that I was able to buffer lactic acid a little bit better because I had more muscle energy from the branch chain amino acids. I wasn't breaking down the muscle tissue as much without mm. it. So I'd have that in my drinks bottle and I found a profound effect from that. Mm. Uh, who would you recommend it to? In terms of, would you recommend it to a college kid who's training hard? If they're training very hard and if they're over the age of 18, for sure. Mm. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. It doesn't matter if you're 18 or 80. Yes, I'd suggest it. Okay. While I wanted to just talk about supplements with you on this episode, I can't help but talk about other weight training based concepts. I remember there was this concept that had really helped me a lot, which was called G flux. Do you remember this? Which is, no, what's G flux? Uh, it's basically, it's an easier way to get ripped. Like the basic concept is that you just spend a lot of calories. Like when you're doing your cardio, you go ham with your cardio. Oh, so it's like hit or Tabata? Yeah, something like that. Okay. Um, so therefore, you're over, and then if you combine that with weight training, uh, it leads to better aesthetic results. You're basically burning off more calories and then still being in, in a caloric excess yeah. uh, through clean food. So say if you're- oh, uh, So you'd be in excess, not deficit. Uh, yeah, you're in, in, in it's, it's to put on muscle. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I understand. So uh, it's, it's why when footballers <laughs> take off their, like their jerseys, mm -hmm. there is a certain amount of ripness even in footballers that you consider fat. Yep. Like I remember people used to consider Wayne Rooney fat. But if he took off his t-shirt, he was ripped. Mm. Um, that's an outcome of G-Flux. That they're burning off so many calories, but still eating clean. Therefore, yep. they end up looking like that. It's a very aesthetics-oriented topic. Yep. Uh, you have anything to say? Yeah, for sure. So I often have clients doing that style of training when they're in a calorie surplus. Because there's going to be less, and if they're sleeping well, that their cortisol levels are low, they're managing stress then that works great at keeping them lean whilst building muscle. Mm. The only time I stay away from a lot of HIIT work is usually when that person is in a major calorie deficit because I don't want their cortisol spikes any more than the weight training workouts because I'm trying to maintain or build muscle in that instance. If they're trying to build muscle and in a calorie surplus, their cortisol levels just aren't really as much of an issue for me. So then I usually do that. But Occasionally, I'll do it with people in a calorie surplus, uh, calorie deficit on their non-training days. Never on a training day, though. What's the biology behind this? Like, what what actually changes when you do this level of a uh, caloric output based exercise versus when you don't? Well, not only are you burning the fat at the duration of the time when you're doing the cardio, you continue to burn it for hours after. You know, your metabolism has been basically kickstart from that aerobic and anaerobic overload from that cardiovascular exercise that you've just done at a very high tempo. So your mm. body still is requiring a lot more calories and burning through those calories for hours after that. Where with steady state, let's say you're on a power walk, you're going to burn the body fat during that movement and you're going to synthesize the food better after, but the fat burning only happens at that duration of time. Yeah, I think the core concept behind G-Flux was uh, what you spoke about synthesization of food and uh, improving your carb sensitivity. Yeah, 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 for um, sure. Like if you were to measure, um, you know, with an Apple Watch or something like that, you'll notice that you burn so many more calories better throughout the day, more efficient. Mm, uh, okay. In terms of HIIT, are you a fan of it? Like, In a calorie surplus. Okay. Yeah. I, when I used to train college kids, I would put all of them on it. And that gave me my best results. I don't know now whether this is an Indian thing or was specific to those guys. But uh, I think a lot of them were trying to put on muscle. And I feel it's a fantastic lifestyle to maintain if you can keep up with it mentally and keeping time as oh, a yeah. factor. It's a challenge for sure. But the one thing, the, what, the reason why I'm a fan of that when people are trying to put on muscle is put on, put, and put on weight is that usually their cardiovascular function declines at that time. They're getting, they're getting heavier, 
uh, they get a little bit lazier sometimes and just focus all on weight training. And they think, okay, if I do any form of cardio now, that's going to be counterintuitive to my goal. I'm trying to retain all these calories. And it isn't always the fact. And they're not able to keep up the intensity of their workouts because they've become so unfit and mm. not cardiovascular functional. So when they do that type of HIIT training in a calorie surplus, it only helps with the intensity of their workouts, their cardiovascular fitness, so they can recover from their uh, workouts so much better as well. Conversely, if someone's lifting weights six times a week, uh, but you know, maintaining a short duration between sets, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. does that count as enough cardio? Like on, on the seventh day, if they don't do anything, no, I wouldn't say it, it's uh, it's en enough for their cardio okay. uh, aspect. You know, you you'll feel more of a, a cardio workout maybe doing legs, but mm. well, that's pretty much it. It's not going to get your heart rate up consistently for long enough to be considered, you know, heart healthy. The biology behind doing cardio in the first place is to give your heart a workout. Yeah, for sure. Because even know? that's a muscle. Yeah, and it helps with the recovery if you've got a better blood flow throughout your body which is going to transport nutrients to localized areas that you're going to train, then you recover so much better. I know if I do cardio, uh, when I'm trying to build muscle, I recover so much better and I can train more intently, mm. uh, intensely and more frequently. We've had Basu Shankar on the show, who was responsible for Virat Kohli's transformation. I told you about Virat yeah, Kohli yeah, yeah. outside and all that. Uh, he told me that most cricketers, I think all the cricketers are on creatine and they... Uh, are on it for like a month and off it for a month. Yeah. That's how athletes are administered creatine. We're not athletes. As in when we're, you know, living in the city, um, though I'm very active, I don't have an athlete's lifestyle. Um, how much should an average urban human be consuming creatine? Should everyone be on creatine? Uh, for me, it's made a world of a difference to how much weight I can lift and the way I look. Like all my girlfriends have always noticed when I've been on creatine and when I've not. And and I'd say the same for my team. So it's been the one supplement that I've really benefited from over years of using it. And I use it carefully. I drink a lot of water. Uh, I go off it. But Chris Gethin, what's the 101? Yeah, for the average person that's on the street, they probably don't need it. But the active individual that's trying to progress and maybe hit personal bests or play sports at a decent level yeah take creatine mm. now you're going to get the very few that aren't receptors to creatine and it all depends on a different form of creatine that you take as well so with a monohydrate sometimes the you know which is the most studied form and the most studied amino acid and supplement out of all supplements out there not only for performance but purity and safety as well so anyone who says creatine is not safe it is the most studied supplement for safety as well. It's a safe product. I think the argument again is something related to water. Yeah, hydration. If people aren't hydrated because it, it pulls set, uh, fluid into the cell of that creatine and into the muscle, then yeah, you're going to be dehydrated. So you'll need to drink more water when you're taking creatine, no doubt. Now, some people will take creatine monohydrate and they are not receptors to it. Sometimes it gives them stomach upset because the particle size just cannot absorb through the stomach wall lining. So then you can take another form of creatine, which is called HCL, which is creatine hydrochloride, okay? Mm. Which is a lot easier. So it's a more concentrated form of monohydrate, which is a lot easier for your body to absorb. So if you're taking a creatine monohydrate, you take 20 grams per day. Is okay? there any downside to having uh, the hydrolyzed creatine? No. So no. why doesn't everyone uh, take it? Every Some people respond better to creatine monohydrate. Some people cr respond better to creatine hydrochloride. Gotcha. Everyone's different. Now, with a creatine monohydrate, the standard dose is usually about 20 grams a day. So you'd have a, 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 a five grams before your workout, five grams after your workout, then another 10 grams throughout the day. I usually just put it in my gallon drug and <laughs> drink it throughout the day. It's a lot easier and convenient. And then when a hydrochloride, it's usually based on that person's body weight, but it's usually, God, six grams, say, maybe in total throughout mm. the day. And that's why you'll find it a lot in like pre-workouts uh, or post-workouts because it's it's much more condensed and you don't have to have so much in a scoop at that time. But I think, you know, creatine is obviously found in naturally in a lot of protein sources like meat products and stuff like that. This is just a, a more convenient way and a more condensed way for you to get it in. 
So what I always explain to people when they say, well, what does creatine do for me? It helps produce more ATP, adison triphosphate, which is the energy source utilized in more explosive movements like sprinting, powerlifting, or bodybuilding, okay? And let's say if you're stuck, you've hit a plateau, you can only get 11 reps or maybe 10 repetitions out, it could potentially help you get that 11th rep out mm -hmm. or that 13th rep out, okay? That one more repetition that you usually stop short of. Which which matters in the long term because it yeah, compounds. Yeah, for sure. Because it's failure. When you're failing, when you're really struggling on that last rep, that's where usually your success is found. Mm. Let's say if you're trying to get to 12 repetitions, the first 10 is a waste of time, but you need to do them to get to your failure point. So if you, you know, you're doing your 10 reps just to get to your 12, but you can do 13, that one makes a huge difference. And can you be in creatine throughout the year? Uh, you can, but some people aren't always as responsive when they do creatine throughout the year. So it's usually, you mentioned, uh, if, uh, I think four weeks on, four weeks off was suggested. I usually go for eight weeks on and four weeks off. I usually finish my entire bottle and then take like a month off. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. And, and you do see a visual difference in terms of because your muscles are letting go of the water. The fluid, yeah. So you do look a little leaner. Yeah. You push a little less in the gym. But when you're back on it, um, you have a slightly higher jump than the previous time if you're serious about your training. Yeah, and having a little bit of that extra fluid retention can help with your joints and the connective tissue surrounding your joints as well. So you can push a little more and not feel as much strain on your joints. And much like, you know, having salt in your diet. Mm. If you're getting a good salt in there, I believe salt is like the mineral version of creatine <laughs> where you get a little bit more fluid retention. You're able to push so much more and feel stronger, especially in a, you know, humid climates, you know, yeah. in lots of parts of India where you're sweating a lot, you know, you need to have that salt in your diet. Maybe it's the same logic as uh, when you eat a lot of shit, you become a lot stronger. Yeah, possibly. <laughs> I'm not saying that I'm going to be an advocate of that, though. Just have the salt. <laughs> okay, we got to talk about pre-workouts, Mr. Gethin. Uh, what is the deal with pre-workouts? Like, do you give them to any of your clients? Oh, all of my clients. Okay. All of my clients, but it has to be a decent pre-workout. Mm. So there's certain ingredients that you should be looking at. So, you know, unfortunately, we're talking about food where, you know, you can be marketed to very easily and you don't know what you're getting. You always have to look at the ingredient profile on the back. Now, this will require a lot of research on behalf of the consumer, okay? Because we see all these ingredients on the back. We go, wow, that must be good. But are all of those ingredients in the dosages that have been studied in research to be effective? Okay, so let's say 6.5 grams of citrulline that gives you a pump has been shown to be effective in research. But you purchase this pre-workout and it only says 1.5 grams of citrulline. Then it doesn't matter that this does not going to have an effect on you. So it doesn't matter how many ingredients are in there. We call, in a supplement industry, we call this as uh, um, sugar coating or powder dusting mm. or magic dusting, you know, the, the product, where it's just dust. You know, mm. there's hardly anything in there that's more effective. You'd probably be better off having just the five ingredients as opposed to the 20 ingredients, but in proper dosages. And you should always look for patented ingredients whenever possible. So a patented ingredient is going to be an ingredient that has been studied and tested for purity, safety, and performance, and then patented it. So let's say beta alanine. That's a popular ingredient in pre-workouts. Can give you a tingly sort of feeling, okay? But that really buffers lactic acid, okay? Now, the patented version of that is called carnosine. So you need to then research what are the patented versions of these ingredients in this pre-workout that I need? What are the dosages of these ingredients that I need in this pre-workout? So there's going to be a little bit of research that should be done by the individual before they purchase. Yeah. Uh, got to highlight fat burners, Mr. Gethin. Sure. It's very popular in India. And uh, I think it's popular because a lot of people look at it as a cheat code to burning off fat rather than doing the dirty work and just avoiding your burgers and pizzas and dessert. Uh, do you have anything to say? Yeah. And again, it is to supplement your perfect diet and activity towards fat loss. Doesn't make up for it. Doesn't mm. make up for the shortfalls. Now, you're going to get a lot of fat burners out there, unfortunately, that are just full of caffeine. It's going to give you a buzz. And that is it. You need to look for certain ingredients in there that is going to help you 
with blood sugar stability. So for instance, um, like chromium or berberine, these are ingredients that will help with blood sugar stability, okay? And then you'll have other ingredients in there that can help with cravings, for instance, you know, or other ingredients that help with um, thermogenesis. So that could be like capsicum or the patented version of it is called Capsimax that raises your body core temperature, you mm. know? So there's various ways of how these body, these uh, fat burners should help you when you're on a diet. Some can have um, appetite suppressants within them. So if you're craving all the time, you're, you're hungry all the time, then some of these fat burners can have appetite suppressants in there as well. So they have a multi-pronged approach to help you. But again, if you're eating burgers or pizza, no fat burner is going to help you. Mm. Uh, I remember when I first moved to America and I was within the apartment block that I was staying, there's uh, some women in the swimming pool. And one of them said, hey, do you have any hydroxy cuts? And I, that was a popular fat burner back in the day. Maybe it still is. And uh, that woman just wanted the hydroxy cut just to give her energy at the office at four o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> you know, So everybody looks at fat burners very, very differently as opposed to what they were produced for. So say if someone has followed their diet in a very nice way, is training hard, but is not able to burn off that last amount of fat, is that when you would recommend it? Yeah, you know, sometimes, uh, it, you know, like I only added it into Riddick's diet like literally a week ago and we've been on this diet for six weeks already. So now it's like, okay, now stuff's getting hard, probably gonna start getting cravings, probably gonna start getting hungry. We need that extra edge and that's all it is. It's just an extra couple of percent. Um, but can you burn fat without it? Yeah, sure. Mm. You know, people who kind of hit their limit with burning fat, they go to about 12%, 13% body fat, which still makes you look great without a shirt on. Yeah. You know, you look like you work out, uh, but they want to go ripped. They want to go Bruce Lee. Like they want those abs and all that. How would you do it as a trainer without the, uh, remember last time we spoke about the water, uh, like you, you let go of water, you avoid oh, salt. That's, that's just like a, a day before a photo shoot, yeah. But say on a regular basis, if you want them to go below that 12%, if you want them to hit like single digits without um, like any anabolic steroid or anything like that, what would you make them do? Yeah, sure. So it's double cardio. So okay. it means cardio in the morning and in the evening. So let's say that that person's weight trading in the morning. Straight after their workout, they'll have their protein shake. Then immediately after that protein shake, they'll go do their cardio because I don't want the cardio to be even more catabolic because mm. the workout's already catabolic. They're already losing muscle there. So I need to splunt that, stop that as soon as possible. Now let's just work, work on the synthesis of the food that you're going to consume throughout the day by burning fat right now. Okay. Then we do the steady state cardio. Eat clean throughout the day, manage their stress, stay hydrated, and then do another cardio. Let's say if we did the first cardio, let's say... 9.30, 10 o'clock in the morning. The second cardio is now 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And it'll be intense? Uh, it's usually, so for instance, if they're walking, it's walking as fast as they possibly can. But they're able to hold a conversation like I am with you now. Mm. So it shouldn't be super intense where it's like um, more anaerobic based where they're really out of breath. Why shouldn't it be super intense? Because I'm trying to keep their cortisol levels down because we've just gone through massive catabolism in their workout, their cortisol levels, their stress hormones were through the roof during that workout. Now I need it as low as possible to retain the muscle and recover from the workout because 24 hours later, we're hitting the gym again and going through a very intense period. And you'd be, I'm assuming you'd be training like six times a week. Five times a week, max. Okay. Okay. And, then and, and sometimes it's a little instinctive. So sometimes it could be two days on. And I look at the, you know, they didn't sleep well, they were stressed or whatever. It's like, okay, let's take a day off. But if everything's perfect, okay, let's train the third day in a row. But then after that third day, let's take that day off. Mm, this is the biggest nugget of gold from this podcast for me. This is a big question that a lot of Indian lifters have. They take themselves to that 12%, 13% mark and don't know how to go beyond that. And I think it be highlighting aspects of the G-Flux conversation we had earlier as well, that where you just have a higher caloric output. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm. Yeah, you know, you have to... Obviously not overtrain, you know, because you, you can't go through like central nervous system fatigue. You know, you have to work with the body instead of trying to fight against the body to get the, the fat down. But a lot of the time it is just making sure that you're in a parasympathetic state, 
you maybe start in the day with a cold shower or ice bath so you can mobilize the fatty acids a little bit easier. You're making sure that you're extremely hydrated. You're going to bed early. You're having good quality sleep. You're meditating. All of these things with a holistic approach usually get the job done and, get, and break through the plateaus. I was about to ask you if there's a role of meditation in building an aesthetic physique because it's helped For me sure. in my life. For sure. Massive. So I get all my clients to meditate, you know, or try to at least. <laughs> um, you know, in the morning and at night, before you go to bed, you should get rid of all the, all the, all the trash, all the stimulation so you can focus on your quality sleep, you know, and then wake up in the morning with a better intention and you're positive and you're looking at life's and a workouts as possibilities, what you can accomplish as opposed to usually the general impossibilities. A lot of people wake up with self-doubt and they go throughout the day with self-doubt. That's not going to help their workouts. They have to go in with every intention that they can do some unnatural things in that gym to get some unnatural results Be when they come out of it. Because the self-doubt and stress will actually biologically lead to a higher cortisol level. For sure. Which and, will... and, you know, you, you create limitations. Mm. Limitations. And if your brain is crowded with other things that you're not going to be present during your workouts or in a parasympathetic state when you're eating your meals, you need to be rested and digesting mm. when you're eating your meals. And I, I have had this conversation with Riddick this morning is that when we're training this muscle here, your delts, I want you to think of every single fiber as an orchestra <laughs> and they all have to sing in perfect tune in order to get out the music that you're trying to create here. You know, mm. All these muscle fibers, you have to think really deep down to get that mind-muscle connection of every single fiber to contract. Mm. Yeah. I think we're talking about mindfulness here. Yeah. And just being present in. Have to be present. No activity. phone in the gym. Yeah. You have to be completely present. And the same, no distraction when you're eating. Yeah. Be present. Something we didn't highlight in the last fat loss oriented episode was this concept of mindful eating, which I've picked up from monks on the show. Mm. They highlighted mindful eating as a very important exercise in furthering their meditation practices. Yeah. Because they were like, if I can focus on just my food, that translates to me improving my levels of focus, which will translate to deeper meditations because yeah. their meditations are all about focus-based uh, exercises. So even just focusing on your food, it can help you achieving higher meditative states and it'll kind of help you know uh, when to stop eating maybe, especially when you're eating junk. Yeah. Because through this whole process of muscle building, you're not going to be eating clean forever. There are going to be days where you have to be at a family function, et cetera. Hmm. Just be mindful of what you're eating in those moments. Yeah, and a lot of people, when they aren't mindful when they're eating, because they haven't focused on the food that they're taking in, they're still hungry. Mm. They get to the end of the meal, like, oh, what else can I eat? Because they weren't mindful or focused on or present when they were consuming that food. Mm. And a lot of it is because they're just like not mindful at all. Yeah, 100%. Um, and you've got to slow down a little bit. <laughs> Put the fork down in between your bites. Chew, enjoy, be grateful. Yeah. You know, I think after the first episode we did, uh, the big learning I got was something I tweeted out. It took me a day to absorb all of it. But the big learning I had was people chase growth in terms of money and growth in terms of muscles. But if you actually just chase growth in terms of mindfulness, you're doing a lot more for your chases of money and muscle. 100%. Because a lot of us are looking for the outcome. We're seeking the success instead of being present with the journey or the sacrifices that we have to make, prioritize them. Mm. One last question for you on this supplements special, which is uh, related to multivitamins and uh, fish oils, etc. And I'm asking you this from a perspective of people who are not necessarily into weight training and mm -hmm. just want to be healthy. What's the scientific truth about multivitamins? What's the scientific truth about fish oils, uh, omega-3 fatty acids as supplements versus... Yeah just from food, can a diet full of raw veggies and different colored fruits and vegetables do the same job for you that multivitamins can? Uh, a lot of the time, no, unfortunately. If okay. you were to ask me this question maybe 60, 70 years ago, I'd have a different answer. Because now with the overpopulation of the countries, the overharvestation of the food, uh, our soil now is very much depleted to what it was many, many years ago. So as an example, like an orange, I don't know if I mentioned this before, that say our grandfathers ate would have seven times the amount of vitamin C 
than the orange that we're consuming wow. today. So a lot of the food that we're eating, no matter how healthy we're eating, is very deficient. So it's very important that you do take in like a multivitamin as your insurance. A lot of the vitamins are, are water soluble anyway. So whatever your body doesn't use, it's just going to pee out. Maybe you'll have a little bit more expensive piss. But, uh, you know, that's all right. It's a safe haven. So, you know, I, I, if you're an active individual, then you'll probably need even more vitamins and minerals. But for the sedentary individual, for sure, only because of the malnutrition that we have going on in our food system today. And if you are eating proteins that feed from the soil as well, feed from the grass, they're going to be deficient as well. Mm. So it, it is a safe haven. And make sure that that multivitamin is like organic based. So it isn't created in a lab. So we can we call that pharmacy to table multivitamins. Instead, try to go for a farm to table multivitamin. Gotcha. Um, and, and with fish oils as well. Again, a lot of the fish is factory farmed. Maybe a lot of people don't eat fish mm. uh, as much as they should. And omega-3 oils, especially in a culture where we're consuming so much vitamin uh, omega-6, uh, I think it's very important that you go for a good, good um, omega-3 oil that is maybe, maybe you know, that it's been extracted from Alaska or off the coast of Chile or something like that. It's not like when you look at a multi, uh, an, an omega oil, it should be quite light in color. So it's been extracted from that fish that's fresh as opposed to very dark and cloudy in color which probably hasn't because that oil usually goes rancid in the fish after it's been killed. And then they leave it and they don't extract it until days later. That's going to be a rancid oil. Also, the pure vegetarian question here, like people are not willing to have omega-3s which are derived directly from fish. I know there's alternatives which are derived from seaweed. Yeah, exactly. Does that supplement enough? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. That's okay. absolutely fine, yes. Okay. Uh, and one kind of step back kind of question, while we talk about highlighting vitamins, uh, fish oils, what does it biologically do to your muscle building process or your fat loss process or just your immunity? On a biological level, what does it do? Well, it's, if you're healthier, if your engine is going to be more highly tuned, then it's going to be more efficient at more output, a better output. So a lot of people look at the macronutrients instead of the micronutrients. The micronutrients provide, provide more health to the body. So it can help with muscle contraction, muscle relaxation, you know, especially uh, minerals in the body. So you know, it helps from a health standpoint, which should be a priority, because when you're healthier, your body responds better. Mm. Okay, gotcha. Anything else that you'd like to add in the supplement special, Mr. Chris Gethin? No, just for people to understand that it is the icing on the cake. Mm. You know, you need to ensure that you have adequate nutrition coming from healthy sources, natural sources. And then once you've got the recipe of that cake down and you're consistent with that recipe, then you put the icing on the cake coming in in form of supplementation. So with my clients, I don't always get supplements in there straight away, especially if they haven't got the sleep, the hydration, the nutrition down first. Mm. Mr. Chris Gethin, another epic episode with you. Thank you for all the knowledge. And uh, on behalf of the Indian youth that's followed you for like 10 years now, uh, I think you still have so much more to give uh, the world, man. Like uh, you're someone who's constantly learning. Yeah. And in a field like yours, we need to have people like you who are constantly staying updated because a lot of people get stuck in their own beliefs. I've seen you change your beliefs according to how peer-reviewed scientific studies change. And the guy you are, especially after getting to know you over the course of three conversations, you're someone I can trust my life when it comes to these kind of concepts. So thank you. No, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And that's why I love doing what I do, because the more that I learn, the more that I realize I don't know mm. a lot. So there's always uh, a constant learning curve of evolution within this industry. No, it's crazy. Looking forward to more episodes with you. Appreciate it. It's an honor, brother. Thank you. Thank you. So that was the episode for today. I do urge you to share this with everyone who's in your fitness group, all your gym friends, all your friends who are interested in the world of muscle, in the world of supplementation, in the world of weight training, or generally in the world of health and fitness. It'll help our podcast a lot. That's the only thing I request of you. Of course, we're going to bring Mr. Gethin back on the show. It's always a pleasure speaking to this man. 
I do also urge you to follow us on Spotify. We're a Spotify exclusive. Every episode's available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. I hope this one helped you in terms of supplementation. I do recommend you check out the first two episodes if you haven't already. We'll see you very, very soon.